everyone. Thank you for joining me as I interview Vera Nazarian. She is the author of over 10 novels, numerous short fiction and anthologies and magazines, plus several novellas. Her most recent work includes the Cobweb Bride trilogy and the Atlantis Grail series. She was a friend and colleague of Tanith Lee's and reissued Tanith's books with her small press, Norlana Books, under Tanith's own imprint, Talika. Thank you so much for joining me today, Vera. And thank you so much, Julia. This is going to be exciting. I cannot wait to talk about Tanith Lee. <laughs> yes, I am very excited too. I love to hear. I know we've done several other interviews with friends and colleagues of Tanith's, and each time I feel like I get a different, you know, viewpoint of her. Um, so yeah, so um, the first thing I just wanted to ask you is how did you meet Tanith Lee, and were you aware of her before you met her? Um, this is an interesting thing because I never actually met Tanith in person and we talked on the phone, we corresponded uh, via emails, physical letters, she sent me books, I sent her things, but we've never really been in the same room and I feel like I've missed out on the the impossibility because Tanif was my favorite author. She still is, bar none. There is no other author in any language that is, to me, more important than Tanif Lee. She is the poetic goddess, <laughs> I would call her. And she changed my writing life because I became an author. Um, I started writing really early. And to, to be honest, English is not my first language. I came from the USSR as a refugee, as a little child, and we got here through Lebanon during their war. They had a civil war. Then we arrived in the United States and I learned English. And some of my earliest memories were re reading fantasy science fiction and it, none of it compared. The minute I hit upon Tanith Lee's The Birth Grave, that was my revelation. Um, I don't know, it, it, actually, I think I read it as soon as it came out and it was in one of those old Daw Books editions and it just blew everything out of the water. There's no other writer at that point that was writing with such poetry, such incredible um, prose. The style that Tanith had was just, you know, it was po It was really prose that was poetic. And I have never encountered this kind of thing before. And I just obsessed. <laughs> I started to read anything possible that had Tanith Lee on the cover, on the spine. And a lot of them were yellow, old yellow dog book spines. <laughs> so that's, I would see it and I would see if it's Tanith. And then I started to write my own books. And um, I was mostly doing a lot of fantasy in those days. And everything that I was doing was somehow in the back of my mind, inspired by beauty and myth and uh, poetry of of English writers would be like um, Oscar Wilde. I would compare Tanith Lee to Oscar Wilde, the kind of level of smart, brilliant, elegant, beautiful kind of, it just takes you off to this gothic, dark, you know, unbelievable other world. So I was inspired by that and I started to write. And then finally, after, uh, you know, lots of years after I was uh, actually, um, you know, published doing some other things, I got to, um, I think I actually wrote Tanith because I started my small press, Norilana Books, and um, it was basically started as um, 2008 um, as a uh, small publishing house to, uh, to produce classics of world literature. And then I started to publish some other living authors. And then I fell into financial situation problems where I could not do that anymore. So, but that's later. So I reached out, I believe, to Tanith ab around um, 2000 and um eight I think the middle of 2000 actually or 2007 and I must have just emailed her through somebody that I knew in the in the industry and um she responded and I said Tanith I would love to re reissue your books because Tanith Lee was in the middle of being not published anywhere I mean her books were out of print what what in the world you know how can you do this <laughs> this greatest author was being just forgotten just you know her um, her, her Tales of the Flat Earth, um, the Birth Grade Trilogy, Wars of This, all these books were like not there. So I reached out to her and somehow or another she wrote back and it was email. And then we started and then we had a phone call and I sent her one of my novels, which was uh, Lords of Rainbow, that this book is actually out of print right now. So you, you will not <laughs> see it anywhere. But this book was about a world without color. And it had this handsome blonde hero, which was 
totally inspired by Tanith Sirion and some of the other beautiful men. Because Tanith, unlike other people at the time writing fantasy, she would focus on the male beauty and she had these demon lords. And so I sent her a copy of that book. She read it. She enjoyed it. She wrote me back and I wrote, you know, back and forth. And we, um, I made a press release back in, in January 16, 2008 was the, was when we, we decided to have this dedicated imprint. This is her, completely her idea, because I was just going to do Norilana books, you know, I didn't know any better. So Tana said, we're going to put it under Talika, T-A-L-E-K-A. -A. And it was capitalized, interestingly, it was uppercase T, lowercase A, uppercase L, lowercase E, uppercase K, lower, lowercase A. And the K-A part was for Kane, as in John Kane. So that was just amazing. She put herself Tanith Lee and John Kane in one word. And that's what that was supposed to be. And the books that we started to publish, starting with, um, I published her works from September 1, 2009, through February um, something 2014. So we started with, we were doing Knight's Master, book one of Tales of the Flat Earth. Then we had uh, Sounds and Furies, which was an original collection, never previously published. And it was a World um, Horror Convention special edition. It was a short story collection. Then we went back to Death's Master, The Birth Grave, Delusions Master, Delirium's Mistress, which unfortunately had to be canceled. I had the book already to go and it, we even had, you know, review copies mailed out. But because I, like I said, my, my small press imploded. I could not pay royalties. It was just horrible. But what happens is my small press right now only publishes me and public domain work. So I don't do living authors anymore. And when I had to go and tell Tanith that this was happening, she was, she really did not want to. She actually wanted me to keep going with it. But I said, Tanith, this is just not good for anyone. We're, I'm not doing this right. So I gave back all her rights. And luckily, this little period of time from 2009 to 2014 was when her books was kind of, you know, they were made available. And Daw Books finally picked it up again because they were the original published. So they picked her up and reissued and started. So Tana's work went back into circulation, but I was like the tied, tied her over until it happens type of thing. And then of course came in people like uh, uh, Storm Constantine, who'd had her wonderful Emanuel Press. And, you know, there are other small presses. Then there's people like Craig Gidney. And I think, um, I'm trying to think if he has a, um, if there's a little press associated, but all these wonderful people who just, you know, great fans inspired by Tanith. And one thing I want to tell you, this, this is just very special to me. Um, Tanith, um, she had something called um, her nieces. Okay. I don't know if you, you, you are aware of this thing, but Tanith felt that there were several um, younger or whatever, you know, other authors low way we're we're here. Tanith is up there, you know, we're here. So uh, there are several, um, women authors who were writing in her spirit and she felt that Tanith didn't really want to have kids and she she told me that she just wanted to have nieces instead so she felt more comfortable with that designation so she called me one of my nieces and this is how it happened um I was talking to her um on the phone she was in England I was here in America and I think back then I wasn't still in, was I in California yes no maybe not I don't know I'm in Vermont <laughs> right now so Tanith and I were talking and here's the thing. I am not the, I don't have the best hearing because I used to do a lot of phone work doing tech support in the nineties with headsets. So my hearing is shot and she has a strong British accent. It was beautiful, but I'm just, I cannot hear it very well. So she is telling me that um, like something about me being her niece and, and, I, and I'm like, um, yes, Tanith, because uh, of, of course my mind is blown every time I would, I would talk to her. It's like, you know, I'm talking to Tanith. I can't hear anything. <laughs> so, and she told me this and I said, thank you. And then I did not quite understand what she meant by this. And then later on I hung up and it occurred to me, she said, she literally told me that I am one of her nieces in the literary sense. And I was just like, how could I, I should have screamed on the phone to her, but I didn't understand. I did not quite understand what was going on. So later on, um, just to give you this idea, this beautiful, beautiful collection came out. This is after she left us. 
Kenneth Lee left us. And this this was one of the books that thank you to John Kane on his beautiful, gorgeous covers. Um, I was one of the people included, but we'll, we'll talk about this later. I want to quickly show you just the editions because we're talking about Tana's books. This this is the this is the beautiful beautiful editions that we did. We did hardcover and trade paperback. Covers are done by artist John Kane, her spouse. So her husband did these amazing covers, starting with Knights Master. Look at that, Knights Master, Death's Master. Um, yeah. Delusions Master. <laughs> I know those but are these beautiful. books. That you, I don't yeah. know if you can even find them. They're very, uh, they're small editions. So that, because, like I said, I'm a micro press. Oh, <laughs> falling apart. So th this is, I can't find the birth grave. I have it somewhere, you know, packed away. But these are the books, and these editions, these are gorgeous. They're completed, vetted by Tanith. We had um. When she gave me the manuscripts, we went over them. She fixed, she did tiny little tweaks. So she she did as any author would after you have had a book out for a while. If you're doing a reissue, you may want to proof it a little. So when she did all that, these are perfectly, we had an introduction, the beautiful artwork. And this is the kind of thing we had. These are Tana's books. And then we had to stop that. Like, again, I just couldn't do, I could not keep doing that. So in the meantime, Tanith left us. So in 2015, um, actually a day before my birthday. So I'm still like, you know, I'm thinking, thank God it was not on my birthday because I would have been like traumatized. I would be for the rest of my life, you know, traumatized. But that doesn't matter. She left us uh, and I also lost my mom on the same year. So it's like, that was an incredible loss. But she has not left us. Tanith is still with us as long as her books are out here. And I know this is a very long answer to your question. How did I meet Tanith? I have not really met her. She was, she was, um, she kind of entered me, <laughs> entered my mind, entered my spirit, entered my soul. And everything that I did since and has been inspired by her work because she's amazing. She's just stunning amazing and I don't know if you want to ask me anything else because I have I could keep going with this <laughs> no yeah I mean that's yeah. I mean thank you for sharing all that I mean that's but, um it must have been I can't even imagine like meeting someone I mean even if it wasn't in person I mean yes, yes. today that like that the boundaries between in person and online are oh gosh are, yes it, it was yeah. meeting or on the phone. my hero you know she, yeah. she was my hero and she was Unlike that um, proverb or uh, saying, people say, oh, don't meet your heroes. Yeah. Oh, no. I met my, she was better than I expected. She was gracious. She was kind. She was just a wonderful person. And I just, you know, I did not realize how short our acquaintance would be because she would pass. Yeah. I did not realize this was going to happen. So I had all these hopes that, oh, you know, I'll go to England or, you know, we'll have a, a one, like a world fantasy. I'll, I'll come and meet yeah. her. But I just never had that chance. So it's, you know, but she's not, she's here. She's always here. Everything I write, everything I do. Um, and I just want to, um, I made a little um, kind of like a big page of notes. <laughs> like the things that inspired me about Tanith in general for my own books, for my own writing. First of all, I mentioned her beautiful style, the poetic um, sentence level perfection, um, reminiscent of Oscar Wilde. But basically anybody else right now, there are a lot of good, beautifully, uh, you know, stylistically beautiful authors writing these days. There are people like Jacqueline Carey, who is um, Cushiel's legacy, author of Cushiel. Um, there is uh, Catherine uh, Valenti, who is a wonderful, you know, prose poet, but, and more, there's others, but... Tanith is up here. She, nobody, nobody. I mean, even people like who else, um, you know, wonderful people who are in fact part of your Kickstarter, the the uh, project like um, uh, Theodora Goss, you know, beautiful. But there's still Tanith is here. All the rest of us are just, you know, we just can't. So the the things that her prose level was just stunning. It, it brought me across to, it transported me. Then the treatment of... Uh, the characters. Tanith Lee had these blonde, gorgeous heroes or these dark, beautiful. The the fact that a lot of fantasy in those days, you did not appreciate man and manly beauty. Tanith was a 
she was so good at that. You you fell in love with her heroes because she made them beautiful. She made them beautiful in every sense. They were dark, mysterious, elegant, and she changed the face of romantic fantasy, as far as I know. Uh, what we call romantic these days, you know, the, the it's like a poor, shallow, sad, <laughs> you know, you know, reflection three times removed. But what what Tana did was she made fantasy. She imbued romance and love and that kind of longing and um angst angst that that did not exist before you would have like Tolkien and we would have yes love lovely wonderful books but that type of weird strange dark soul ringing angst of love is what Tanith did and then of course there was the goth element the dark uh, kind of uh, uh the love of death and darkness the kind of admiration of beauty of like knight's master tales of the flat or dark death's master you fell in love with these dark personifications of um, you know, whatever was, was the terror, the, the kind of horror that was, you know, that she was so good at. She she combined horror with fantasy. And um, the prose was what we would call, um, some people might say it's purple, but that's the best type of purple prose you can have out there. So, and one other thing I want to mention is the synesthesia. That's the mixing of senses. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing the word correctly, synesthesia. But this is something Tanith herself brought up because um, in my when I sent her a copy of this, um, Lords of Rainbow, which is a world of color. So there's no color in this world. There's only these things. And I had to be describing things using uh, monochrome terms. She mentioned synesthesia, how you can hear, word, hear smell music and hear um, colors and all these interesting ways of mixing senses. This is what she did with her prose. She imbued it with mixing of the senses. And those, in a nutshell, those are the elements that just, to me, make her um, stand far apart, far beyond any uh, anybody else writing, anybody else before or after. She is my Shakespeare. <laughs> so Yeah, I definitely you have it. <laughs> I think there are a lot of authors who, you know, to take the, you know, the term like purple prose, you write very like, elegantly and beautifully but I almost feel like for me at least when I'm reading certain books like that it takes away from the story um, yes you're so focused on like the overflowing of the language but I oh, feel exactly like, yeah with Tanith's books ta excuse me Tanith's books it's just it's like the opposite like I feel like it's so yes. beautiful but I'm also drawn in as well um yes. I mean I'm reading um the birth grave for the first time right now oh I, I, I envy you <laughs> I know which, it's amazing which I know was mentioned in your the the first like Atlantis Grail book um yeah, yeah but I I don't know it's just amazing like the the way she writes because again I sometimes have trouble reading books that are very um like very poetic like I enjoy it but I mean it's right. just like, I can envision everything um, and going back to like the, you know, the um, just gorgeous people. And, um, you know, I just have very clear pictures in my head. But it's yeah, godlike, like, amazing yeah. visual imagery. And you're right about her not being, it's not purple. It's just rich, which some yeah. people, you know, there's Hemingway on one side, which is just invisible prose and that is like, you know, and then there's Tanith who is mm -hmm. so visible, but at the same time, she just, she just makes it real and there's nothing, exactly. nothing extraneous. And I just quickly wanted to mention, this is mm -hmm. my, my best-selling series is the Atlantis Grail series and qualifies book one. And um, as a fun little Easter egg on here on page 17, um, I mentioned that my main character, it's like somewhere here, the birth grave, she, t my main character carries a bag of books to save them from this impending uh, apocalypse, this asteroid about to hit earth. And she puts her favorite belonging in, in a bag. And one of them is the birth grave. So this was an, it was a tribute to Tanith big time. And there are other times I've, I've done things like this too. I've dedicated books. I think some of my volumes here this is the Atlantis Grail. Some of these books are dedicated to Tanith. So it's just, yes. <laughs> her, her amazing purple prose. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I don't know, unparalleled because uh, sometimes it takes you out, but it, it brings you in. Yes. Um, I guess speaking of, you know, all that Tanith inspired you, especially as like even going all the way back to your childhood. Um, yes, yes. You know, yeah, you had told me that 
Um, Dreams of the Compass Rose, Salt of the Air, and The Cobweb Bride were specifically inspired by Tanith Lee. Do you want to yeah. um, explain like how? Either going book Definitely. by Definitely. Yeah. This uh, Dreams of a Compass, this is actually like a re-edition. It's the 10th anniversary. So there's been, this is not the original edition, but this is, a, a, it's like the Tales of the Flat Earth. It's an ancient world story cycle. And it is very similar to also the like the 1001 Nights where you have stories within stories and dream. There are 13 dreams and they come together to form a novel. So it's like characters. these characters are you can put them straight in the flat earth. This is the kind of stuff. So I this is my strongest. I would say this is my me trying to, you know, pray to Tanith, shall we say, and her and her amazing creative spirit. And this is Dreams of the Compass Rose. Now. This is actually my first published novel. It's it's really a um, I call it a collage novel where it's not really a full complete, but it, it, it's a um, it's made out of fragments of stories. In other words, so this is my second published novel was Lords of Rainbow, which again, blonde hero inspired by Tanith Lee and just this amazing this level of dark beauty, you know, monochrome worlds playing with senses. And um, what else did I want to show you? Oh. Here's one, The Duke and His Castle. This is a novella that, uh, this was a, a Nebula Award finalist. And again, this is, a, it's a dark, gothic, really kind of mysterious, the spirit is completely Tanith. And let's see if I have a, uh, I'm an I'm a artist too. So I, this is an illustration I did and it's kind of hard to see, but yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful gothic type hero. So all these works, I I try to include little bits and pieces of Tanith in my in my descriptions, in my um, imagery, in the way that just my characters move, you know. Because elegant elegant people, yes, there are other elegance, but nothing nothing that she, that compares to the way she portrays it. And I want to do another little quick show and tell. This is piratica or piratica i'm not sure how to pronounce these are books actually tanith sent them to me from england so these are copies from tanith. they are signed and i'll just show you let's see if i can find one of the signatures sorry about this yeah there we go so oop <laughs> So that's a Tana. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. Yes. And she accompanied it. And I have a whole file because obviously we have publishing contracts, but also I have a whole pile of correspondence. This is just a sample of her letters to me. And we're just talking about how she, she talked about the Piratica books. And um, she said, uh, dear, dearest Vera, here with the three Piraticas or Piraticas. Hope you like them. Um, anyways, and she goes on about how the editions are out and she just hopes that Maybe someday she'll get the rights back. <laughs> a lot of her thing was getting rights back to reissue things. And because she had all these plans. And just to let you know, here's here's a list of things she wanted to publish through me, through Norlana Books, Talika. Okay, this is just it breaks my heart because we never got around to it. So um, in, in addition to all the books that you saw, we were going to do Vascor, Son of Vascor. Um, which is Shadowfire Book Volume 1. Quest for the White Witch, Shadowfire 2. Sirion. Oh, Sirion. <laughs> the wonderful. The Storm Lord, Book 1 of the Wars of Vis. Night Sorceries. That's uh, Book 5 of the Flat Earth. Anna Kyer, or Anna Kier. I, I'm not sure again how to, pardon me <laughs> if I'm not pronouncing it. Anna Kyer, Book 2 of the Wars of Vis. Earth's Master, Tales from the Flat Earth, Book 6. I believe that's not a... Um, um, that's not an, uh, she was just going to write a new book that doesn't exist. I don't think it does. Is that the one? So that was going to be a brand new book. Oh my Lord. Oh my God. You know, this is just something we didn't, we never got a chance to see. Um, the White Serpent, book three of the Wars of Vis. The Earth is Flat, which we do have Tales of the Flat Earth collection. And an untitled original, which she didn't even have a title for, for book four of the Wars of Vis. And this is something that she told me that I wasn't going to tell anyone at that point yet, but that original was going to tie together the two series, the Wars of This and the um, the um, Shadowfire books were going to be connected. So she was literally going to connect two of her amazing, you know, the, the series together 
and we never got to see that. That's just I, that's just so. I'm like this, yeah. this is a list that it breaks my heart. So anyway, this just had to show this. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean that's just so incredible that you have, yeah. you know, so much. I mean, even just like it sounds like you have a, like you own a treasure treasure trove of. Like, I do, and her some of yeah. um, the the correspondence like I showed you, and also in um, where else you the knight's nieces book. Let me find that one. <laughs> More a moment, knight's nieces. Um, Next to my story, which is night, uh, Streets Running Like a River, that was a story that I wrote specifically with Tanith in mind. Um, there is, um, on the other page, is a photocopy of the correspondence she wrote to me about, she said, I loved your books. And it, it, you can see this in the actual book. This is a copy of a, a correspondence about um, Lords of Rainbow that she, and I, I had to include. This was like a show and tell because a lot of us, other nieces, uh, which is a list of wonderful, uh, wonderful authors: Storm Constantine, um, Cecilia Dart Thornton, uh, me, Sarah Singleton, Carrie Sparing, um, Carrie or Carrie, I'm sorry, Sam Stone, Samantha Stone, uh, Frida Warrington, and Liz Williams, with an introduction by John Kane. So this was the book that she put us in. So a lot of the authors included images personal correspondence so we we are you know this was a book of Tanith and all of us together beautiful imagery of Tanith you know photos people happen to have so so and I didn't have a photo because I never met her in person so I had to have I showed her the the writing the correspondence that we had so oh yeah Lord. I mean even I don't know sometimes I feel like correspondence and personal stuff like that is better than any photo in well my, it, it yeah. it's you know, in some ways it's better. And another thing, here's another um, anthology that was completely original. Um, I edited this anthology. Um, it was called Sky Whales and Other Wonders. Again, out of print, no longer, because um, we had a lead story by Tanith Lee. And this lead story, um, The Sky Won't Listen. The Sky Won't Listen. This one had sky whales, and that's why I named the anthology wow. Sky yeah. Whales. She had this beautiful story about this science fiction about this these sky whales on a planet. So, um, one other thing before I forget, what did I want to, sh to say? Oh man, <laughs> there's so much. There's just so much. Maybe we'll come around to it. So, so let's keep going. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. No, and I know you mentioned um, Sarah Singleton and Frida Warrington. Yes, we had actually done um interviews I didn't but um you know people at Essential Dreams Press had done interviews with them so it's really you know okay. exciting to hear the different knights nieces you know and their interpretation yes. the they're wonderful the, yeah the, the, and each I just, one is in their own way but each one yes we're 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 the the uh, literary nieces the products of the glorious you know outpouring of creativity that she gave us so yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> I don't know very impressive um, I guess we can like pivot a bit. And I just wanted to ask sure. you about your like world building because Tanith was just so, her world building is impeccable. Um, You know, she can really, like we were talking about earlier, really bring you in and um, everything, everything feels just similar enough, um, but also just as um, not a natural, but like unfamiliar, you know? Yes. And so um, I know because you write fantasy and science fiction and all. Yeah, I write, I write everything. You know? Yeah, exactly. You yeah. write everything. So I was wondering if you've taken anything from, well, I know that you said a lot of your writing stems from Tanith Lee, but have you taken anything from her in your world building or how do you approach that? I just love to hear about that. One one of the thing is I am um I am a geek when it comes to world building. I am so detail oriented. So some of the the problem with that is that I get huge thou over a thousand page books so there's a lot of detail in my stories but part of the thing is that I dwell into I go inside the world I get into all the details I try not to spout all the details because you're not supposed to do that you don't want to you know they say that uh, each world that you create is sort of like an iceberg and you're supposed to know all the stuff underwater right there's a huge big iceberg but you really show just the top little part that little uh, you know the nose section the apex of the iceberg because that's all the reader needs to know but the reader has to be able to sense that there is more underneath the depth the the incredible detail 
um, that is real. So that's what makes a world different. For example, you would take certain unnamed, um, I'm not going to start naming names, but certain contemporary, very popular romantic authors who are, I would call them, you know, like a house of cards. They're just a facade. They don't really go deep. But then there's people like Jacqueline Carey, who just plunges in and he, she gives you a beautiful, rich, rich, you know, environment. I try to do the same thing because to me, I cannot put my characters in a place without saying what it is, what what they're standing on, what's over their heads, what does it sound like, what does it taste and smell like. So I give you the details. I give you the descriptions. I try to not to bog them down. You know, I'm, I don't, of course, compare to Tanith at all, but, you know, I can't go to that level. But I try to describe the world. And sometimes what I do is my favorite technique is to take up away an element and then then have the reader miss it. For example, the world without color. So the whole thing, it's an epic fantasy with the other things going on, but the fact that the setting is a world without color and you just have nothing, you know, how do you describe that? How do you come across and you still make it colorful <laughs> with that? Another thing that I was working on, which is not published yet, but um, another um, um, kind of like a world was a world where there is no land. The people live in these floating bits of a broken planet. So it's like there is no firmament. So how do you deal with that? So you take a fan, uh, um, a real world element and you either take it away, change it, enhance it, and it drives the story. And then you have to match all the other description, all the sensory elements that you put in. You have to match it to that new thing, which is that that's what makes it fantasy or science fiction or or dark fantasy or horror you know whatever that that other element is so i go all the way i just i cannot write stories that are not <laughs> that don't go far into every possible direction of the senses so that, yeah well, i mean that makes for such a wonderful reading experience i mean i mean i know people everyone has different um uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Preferences for what they read. Sure. Um, but I really, I don't know. I think that that is the mark of a good author is someone who can bring that um, level of world building and still have the story be the forefront. Yeah. Yeah. Very impressive. Um, of both of you, I think. Um, yeah. And I know this, this is kind of similar, but um, you had mentioned earlier that, um, well, I know that you do your own artwork and also that Tanith Lee, her husband, John Kane, you said did some of the artwork for- He did um, all the covers. I, yeah, yeah. What I did is I, I put together, for example, you would have, um, let's, let's take a look. This is the image he provided. I would put on the lettering, the uh, spine, you know, just for example, if you take off this beautiful jacket and Back in those days, um, th these are print on demand books. So the technology has not developed to the point of it, it has right now because um, I want to carefully take this jacket off ah, without ruining because I these are my few, I do not have a lot of copies. So this is a gorgeous jacket that came about and you have, let's see. So we have some of the design that I incorporated the blurbs, the uh, the bio biography of the author, beautiful picture of Tanith here. So, the, and the, this image, Talika, I think that was, um, I'm trying to remember if this was me or um, the logo. I think it was a combination of me and John. It's you so know, perfect that look. I don't remember. This is terrible. How can I not remember? I was like, I have, I have rotten memory, but I don't know. So we worked really hard. So this was the logo for Talika. I feel like it's a perfect logo. Like it really, you know, I don't know. I just feel it's like, like the moon awesome. and this and the uh, kind of like a sir a half with because Tanith herself was a glorious artist. You know that Tanith did pay, pencil. She did these amazing pencil drawings. So did we include some of that? I think we base this some on that horned moon, the kind of horned moon that she had. She had these um, goddesses with these um, uh, kind of like almost ancient Egyptian headdresses and. This was all of it. You know, the part of the things that I do in my books, I do a lot of ancient history. So I go into ancient Egypt, ancient Greece. Um, I I um kind of soak up the uh, the um Mesopotamia, ancient Mesopotamia, and 
all these horned goddesses and these interesting, um, uh, you know, this, I believe, each one of these designs, yes, it's a John artwork, but I think he used some of her, um, this could have been a Tanith's original um, drawing. So I think what he did, don't, I could be wrong, so forgive me if I am, but I think some of the design that he did was either using some of her original drawings and then building on it because it's John. This is John's artwork, but there may be some elements of that kind of, you know, where you combine, you know, using graphical, you know, image processing or whatever, but whatever. It's it's gorgeous. This is John's artwork, my basically book design, <laughs> putting it all together. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a combination of people, you know, who love Kenneth. We just love Kenneth and we just wanted to do the best we could for her. So that's, <laughs> that's pretty much what we did. Yeah, that's amazing. And I just think, you know, I know you were saying before I started recording. That's his. Her, this is Tanith. Her, I think this is a picture of Tanith um, transformed with his artwork. So, so again, yeah. this is Tanith. It's, but it's been, you know, in John's style. So he processed, he did things, he did his, he put his own mark on it. So yes. <laughs> yeah. And I know you were saying before we were recording that the the art on your wall in the back in your back oh yes yeah that's those paintings all you can see those are my uh, these are oil paintings so yes yeah, yeah. and I saw on your, I saw on your website I think that you do all of your own covers is that correct your yes own? I did yeah. except for the the Atlantis Grail I did get uh, get another artist um I think was what was his name James um James at um goonright.com anyway it's a he's a good designer but before that, I did a lot of my own, for example, let's see if I can find anything. Oh, oh, this one. Actually, no, Salt of the Air. This is not, this is a reissue, but this is not my own design. This is a design by um, Ahikode. I cannot pronounce the word, but she she's an artist with a one name. A-H-C-O-D-I-A, -A -A -A, something like that. So she does this gorgeous um, and... Um, but this was my own, this was an addition that I used her design and I put her put her um, with an introduction by Jean Wolf. This was my short story collection. That uh, That's the other book that I was going to mention that is very, very inspired. All the stories here are like, kind of, you know, I, I worked my butt off <laughs> to get them right. But let me see if I can just find one of the, uh, oh, yeah, this is my own. This is a design using some, public domain art and so so this is my own art uh, design and oh here's one another yeah a lot of this is incorporating public domain and putting in my own spin so my own design my own um yeah this is it oh it's an arc <laughs> so this is like not even an actual book this is one of the arcs but yeah so I did over 300 uh covers for my uh public domain books so Tons of covers, tons of art, <laughs> and uh -huh. I am not. I am not up to the contemporary levels of graphic design, so I'm nowhere near. This is like old. We're talking about like last decade or so. <laughs> so I try not to do covers anymore because I'm just not up to it. But I do physical art like that. You know, physical oils on canvas or um pen, pen and pencil. So yeah, well, they're they're all like amazing from what I can tell, and I just think it's really. I love that. Um, you know that you said Tanith herself was an artist um she is, yes. yeah and that her husband is like a visual artist as well and I just yes and a writer I believe John yeah. as far as I know he he's also a writer so it's like you know <laughs> yeah all the, different I, sense. all the overlap between the different you know parts of writing and I mean there's there's so much that goes into writing and then you yeah. know we were talking about her sense of like you know her description I wonder if that you know, plays into it and yours as well. I just think it's really, it's really cool to think about and see, um, especially if you're, you know, creating work from your books as well, you know? You know, just the spirit of her lives in me and the synesthesia, I can never, I am apologizing because I cannot say that word. And my no, English I don't know is, how to say it. <laughs> my English is honestly, I, it's my second language. So I'm just, you know, there's certain words that I cannot say very well. So synesthesia, syn synesthesia, that's the word where you, the mixing of the senses. And that's what Tana said, that she, that was her, we started the conversation and that's what she was talking about. You mixing art, uh, verbal art, 
you know, literature, art, literature, music, because to her, she was talking about how colors and music and sounds, you know, there. So all these things together, they're coming together and they're different. That makes her writing different. That that's what made her so, so different from everybody else. Because she yeah. just she she poured this, she poured the beauty, she poured the vision, and the sounds came out, and like the reader could feel it. You know, you could actually sense something was different. You know, there are other great writers out there, but what is this? This is just a step above. So yeah, definitely. And I know, like speaking of, you know, all of that coming together, Tanith was um a master of weaving genres. Um, and I I know that you also, we were talking earlier about how you know, how you've written, like, everything under the sun, it sounds like. Um, so, yeah, I'm wondering if that also, yeah, came from Tant's influence or, um, yeah, how you came about writing just everything and the process and if it's different. So if you want to talk about that at all. Sure. Um, uh, uh, for example, what I uh, what I call my uh, my um, series, The Atlantis Grail, I call it cross-genre. This guy right here, it's a big, fat, <laughs> fat books, huge, huge volumes. Um, it's cross-genre because it's, Technically, you would put it, if you were going to use one, it's science fiction, but my goodness, there's so many other things going on. There is ancient history, you know, the legend of Atlantis, mythology, um, romance, hard as astrophysics. Um, there's um, kind of relationships and school acad academia setting. Um, there's uh, family bonds, love, of course, romance, adventure, action adventure, um, puzzle solving and game lit, you know, game lit being, you know, games, because there's the games of the Atlantis. So this is just one of the ways I do it. I just cannot seem to pick a genre and it doesn't make it very easy to, to promote books like that because as a small press and an author who sells besides, you know, I had, I finally established a small press that, uh, that gave me the opportunity because right now self-publishing is a very, very, uh, uh, kind of like a force of nature. <laughs> so we're doing a lot of it ourselves. So to do all this myself, I, you know, I have to categorize and a lot of writers. And I wonder if some of this was the problem for Tana being kind of not seen at that point, because she was this amazing fantasy with science fiction and other things and dark and, and dark fantasy and horror. And, you know, so she blended these things and they didn't know what to do with her. They just, the publishers just stopped because she was not easily, they couldn't just stick her in this slot because, you know, like they say, square peg in a, you know, in a round hole. She was, she was a star and, and you put her in a little, you know, basic, you know, you know, so basic container of genre, which just was wrong. <laughs> so that could have been why she was not, she was kind of like disappearing out of view there for a while because, she, you know, how do you describe her? I don't know. She's. She's fantasy. She's science fiction. She did, um, you know, dark. She did, um, I believe she even did TV, you know, episodes of, what was it? Um, Blake Seven. She did, she wrote the screenplays for the, the episodes of Blake Seven on, on the British TV. So yeah, she, and she did everything. And when you have too much of everything, it's hard to categorize. So cross genre, and I do the same thing. You know, I, I, I do find it troubling to, to, um, say, okay, I'm going to focus in this direction, but I can't. <laughs> so. Yeah, definitely. I know that, um, yeah, Julie C. Day, who is the editor-in-chief for um, Storyteller and then also um, runs Essential Dreams Press. I mean, she also, like, her book, The Rampant, had, I believe it was Sumerian um, mythology in it. And then Maya Dean, who is an author for Storyteller, um, she wrote a book about, um, I believe it was Achilles and it's just, you know, so it's just really. Sure, exactly. Myth, yeah. legend, uh, ancient mythologies. That's Tanith. That's like the mm -hmm. heart of Tanith. So. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it's just cool. Cause um, you're right that it, it would have been hard to categorize, but I think today there's more um, leeway for authors, especially with like small. Well, small presses and self-publishing. Self -publishing, you're yeah. in control. You know, right now I have, I'm, I am technically a hybrid, which means I do both trad pub and, you know, traditional publish with big publish. And, but mostly I, I don't want to, like my audio books are all traditionally published because I just don't have the resources to do audio recording. And can you imagine having Tanith's audio books? Oh, the beauty of having it read by a wonderful narrator, you know? So all this stuff was not even around, it was not available back then. So, and when I say then, it's only like a, just a 10 or so years ago you know just 
So she could have really like, I think she could have had a second rebirth or, and ex re exploded on the scene because that's what she deserves. She's, she would be what I call a classic. She, she is a living classic and she was from the moment she started writing. <laughs> So. Yeah, and I know it's it's so um this past Saturday as we're recording this was the um the SFWA like she they awarded the Nebula her. Awards, I believe. That yeah, was, yes, yes. Yeah, and yeah. um, you know, the posthumously that award and I yes. just think the Infinity Award. Yeah, like, I just think it's like is. it's sad. I mean it's really wonderful, but it's also just, you know, sad that she wasn't able to garner that support during her lifetime. And oh, I, I yeah I agree. Oh, yeah. I, I mean she's just so and so, you know, she is getting her like rebirth, but you know, yes. sadly she's not around to see it, at least on this plane. She right? should have been a grandmaster. See, this is the one thing that uh, Sifwa or the science fiction fantasy authors um, of America used to be called that. Now it's, um, what is it? Science fiction fantasy authors association. So it's still Sifwa, but yeah. They give out grandmaster awards to great people in the genre. And Tanith, I don't think she ever got one, which is, I think it's a travesty. For God's sake, give Tranith, yes, the Infinity Award is lovely, but give her an official Grandmaster of, which was the big award of that, of the, um, the organization. So, yeah. Yeah, I know. So I just wanted to um, begin to wrap things up because we've been going for quite some time, which is awesome. I love hearing about all of this. <laughs> yes. But is there anything that um, we haven't touched on that you'd like to discuss about Tanith? Anything um, that you want to um, bring up? I want to talk about how, oh, how what a lovely person she was. I mean, a lot of people don't understand that, you know, there's sometimes there's the author persona and then there's the, you know, what you read and then the person might not be as, she was lovely. She was the wonderful, she was kind and gentle and she, she was just this wonderful, smart, you know, she had a, she had a great, you know, presentation, personality, sense of humor. She was loving to her fans and she deserves to be out there. She deserves to be really, really seen. So I, I'm hoping that your um, great project, the Kickstarter with the anthology and all, I hope it start, it's the beginning of this renaissance for Tanith Lee works. Tanith Lee needs to be out there. We need to have a convention. We need to have a Tanith con, okay? We need to have a Tanith, um, all these, uh, you know, whatever the publishers, I think she's still with Daw, but, you know, publishers needs to get their act together, reissue, um, to meet the demands of book talk, you know, the TikTok book, book talk is the people who created that craze for physical sprayed edges, beautiful stamped gold foil editions. That's what we need for Tanis. So the next Kickstarter we need to do, if somebody yeah, can do yeah. that, you know, re bring her books out in this beautiful foil stamped, uh, you know, uh, uh, sprayed edges editions so that book talk can go crazy for her because that's what we need to do. For them to notice you, you have to be in those type of physical editions. And for once, you know, her books would match the, in the interior, the glorious prose would match the physical exterior. So get on that someone out there here. Yeah, here. book talk is definitely do that. Yeah, book talk, the, the book talk cre treatment, the gorgeous edition treatment that she deserves. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think, you know, I think her, because her writing is so diverse, I think it would really appeal to, you know, so many different audiences. Like, yes. I've never heard of Tanith Lee, and I'm in my, like, I guess my early 20s. I don't know. But, I mean, I am. Okay, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, from what I'm telling a lot of people, who are Tanith Lee, you know, super fans are like a decade or more older than me, but I feel like there's so much in her work that yes. people my age would connect to. I mean, even her, like, um, her, you know, the, the queer aspects of her story. Oh, yes. Diverse, yeah. queer, gender yeah. fluid. She's got it all. Yeah. I think that's, you know, her demons are beautiful almost shape-shifting gender, whatever they are everything. So, yeah. Definitely. I don't know. So I agree with you. I think book talk should pick her up and find yeah. that TikTok. I'm, oh, I'm not, not. so. <laughs> uh, before yeah. I forget, there's this one book, one of Tanith Lee, Lee's books, um, Romeo and Juliet, Sung in Shadow. Have you read, have, you know, the audience here read it? Sung in Shadow needs to be known because she took the story of Romeo and Juliet. She, she did a, she one-upped Shakespeare and she did a better ending. <laughs> okay. 
So some in chat, I love that. I mean, there are, I love every, like I, I, I could just go on and you could like, you would tell me to go away and stop <laughs> because I would go, uh, uh, you know, pick one book and talk about it for a whole hour. But so sung and shadow, it's just something I would love for it to be better known because that's Romeo and Juliet as it should have been, you know, it's just perfect. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, so I, haven't, I haven't heard of that, but I know there's like, there you go. See, it's like even, yeah. even Kenneth people, like I honestly, I have not read all of Kenneth's books up that they're out there because there's so many. And thank you heavens and universe that there are more for me to read because, yeah. you know, there are a few that I have not had my hands on and, Part of the problem is they're out of print. So everything is out of print and everything is hard to get get your hands on. And yeah, and so to us, we're fortunate that because there's more books of hers that we can read. <laughs> so. I know. And I even like um, before I started this, like when I was beginning my internship with Essential Dreams Press, I went to like a local used bookstore expecting to be able to find like Tannic Lee books and I couldn't find any which I thought was ridiculous like I guess that's either a good thing that people want to hang on to it or it's like a you know they're just not in in as much circulation yeah. I don't know it's really a, it's it's yeah. both like just like you said it's a good thing and a bad thing because good because we we treasure like I had to get onto uh, I believe I tried Amazon and eBay just to find rare editions of certain things and I have upstairs I have a whole shelf of Tanneth Lee you know just everything I could think of. And they're still, they're not everything. I just couldn't. Um, I think I finally found um, the Princess Hyacinthi or Hyacinthi, uh, the, the children's book. And I don't really, I think it took me years just to get my hands on that. <laughs> you know, it's, just like they're, it's an old, ancient, library, terrible condition book, but I got it. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, I don't know. I'm hoping. They're in horrible condition. A lot of these, you know. <laughs> Somebody that adds character, I guess. Yes. <laughs> Um, I'm hoping, and I, I know Julie is hoping, hoping as well, that this will, people will become, you know, there will be more interest in them. They'll get, you know, more in print, basically we'll see. And I know I was surprised to even, you know, to see the amount of people who, I mean, we had like 424 backers for the Kickstarter. And I just think that's, you know, we weren't sure how that was going to go. And that's just really, that's really cool that, you know, and then word of mouth market, you know. Oh, yes. Bring, bring us out of the woodwork because people don't, a lot of the times it's the older generations that read Tanneth that remember her, the new, the newer people, people on book talk need to know about her. So once, you know, once there's demand, I think publishers will bring the books, you know, we will bring yeah. them out and, you know, hello, uh, Da Books or whoever is out there that has, to, has the rights to her work right now, because that needs to be out. Her work needs to be in print permanently. You you may not have her out, her works out of print. So I know there's a lot of at least um, in the past few years there's been a lot of pushing to get um, to uncover like um, like previously marginalized people in different communities who had like pushed um, you know books or science or anything forward. And I I think that you know now is the perfect time to continue on covering do you know what i'm saying like yeah. yes i do i do yeah. and just talking about marginalized i think um here's the problem right now her books may have been banned in places i mean in certain places that's the type of books that would have been banned for being true to themselves and beautiful and you know transcending every category of you know lay old old style old school binary labels the books would have been you know and again good and bad because that's what that's what it is. She she was way before her time. She was so ahead of <laughs> of a lot of other people at that time. Yeah, and I know that um a lot of people who have been interviewed have talked about how much of a lifeline her books were for them, like growing up in you know maybe more isolated or communities or even just like time periods. So I think yeah, I think it's important to pay. I don't know how to say this word homage, homage. I don't know. Some homage, I think. Homage. Yeah. I okay. Think, right. Yeah. Homage. <laughs> any. <laughs> like that, that word not is like, and then not. I don't know. It's right. like you, you know words. We don't know how to say them. But anyways, right. Right. yeah. I think it's um, it's just it's important to know your history, and I think that she's a big part of that history and can continue to be, you know, a big part of what's to come. Um, but I I think um I just wanted to ask one last question before we part ways, which is, do you have anything you want to promote for yourself? Um, so um, well, basically, I am writing. I'm still working on um, 
this is a completed series, but I have a new book coming out in, in probably in, a, in the next month or two. It's called Eos, which is the first book of the ancient Atlantis, because this is futuristic. This is uh, this book is in is in the near future, and it it uh, basically talks about the idea that ancient Atlantis was destroyed by cataclysm, but the people escaped and they formed a colony on another planet somewhere out there in space, and they come back to assist modern humans to help them during that the the asteroid apocalypse so but the the prequel series that i'm working on is going back to the original ancient atlantis because my readers wanted to know how did that happen how did the atlantis sink and what happened and how did they escape and all these other things you know, so that's what i'm working on right now continuation of the atlantis grail called dawn of the atlantis grail <laughs> I always think that's so cool when authors go back and like, you know, and again, that's world building, right? It's, it's it goes yeah. so much. Well, you, you know, um, not that I have this, I, uh, unfortunately I don't, but I literally have books of um, like a Bible of my world. It's a, it's called the Atlantis Will Companion. I had to create a book of all the things that I, and I had to come up with a, a people of the Atlantis Will. Another book was just the, like an, uh, a character, detailed character, um, um, kind of like a um, uh, dramatis personae, you know, type of listing. So I have so much stuff to, <laughs> to dig into and that's what I'm doing right now. I'm working, you know, and hopefully I will, um, I will do more mentions of, um, you know, more little Easter eggs with Tanith, you know, like including the birth grave in the book <laughs> and just, you know, mentioning Tanith Lee because yes, it's all I can do. Maybe an incarnation of Tanith Lee was back in the Atlantean. Period. I know, or something, yeah. you know, just mentioning, because I, I got, I, you you cannot not mention her. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank I you. really enjoyed this interview. I feel like I've gotten to know Tanith a little bit more. Um, it's so cool how everyone has such different yet similar depictions of her and stuff, you know? So, yeah, thank, thank you for, for giving me an opportunity to blather and go on and on. I mean, I could do this for hours. So it's like, you just stop me now. <laughs> so yeah, no, this was yeah. a pleasure. Thank you so much. Remembering Tanith again, it was just, you know. Yeah, it sounds like an amazing person. So, yes. Yes. <laughs>